Imagine if he was a teacher, all the things students would have to unlearn. I'm Peter, that's Larry. We were referred to at one point uh, when we did our 15 city speaking tour of the United Kingdom as the Simon and Garfunkel of ufology. We don't sing, though. Uh, I wanted to begin just to let you know a little bit uh, about who we were because although we are strange animals ourselves, we are not actually in the field of cryptozoology. Uh, we co-wrote a book uh, based on Larry's experiences as a security police officer in the United States Air Force stationed in England around what is now regarded as the certainly best known and best documented UFO incident in the history of the United Kingdom. I'm proud to say our book was a bestseller around this country and um, we still occasionally get bought free beers and that is not a bad perk. Uh, John has been um, reckless enough to give us an hour of time to share some memories uh, with you uh, of our work together. The book took nine years to write. Both of us had had a fair amount of experience in the field beforehand. And what we decided to do today was, as much as possible, give you what we call excerpts and outtakes. Stories, anecdotes, memories that didn't make it into Left at East Gate. We don't have any copies here. It is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, through the black market, your local bookstore. And uh, we hope that some of you have read it and some of others of you will read it. But uh, so many goofy, strange, weird things happened to us in the years of working on the book that certainly should never have made it into the book appropriately. And uh, I want to share a bunch of them with you. I wanted to start briefly with one short anecdote that has nothing to do with our work on the book, but <clears throat> when I got into this work uh, more than 25 years ago, I, I did my first speaking engagement in the early 1980s at a conference in upstate New York sponsored by an organization no longer with us. Uh, that was a UFO research organization whose, primary, whose membership was primarily composed of American police officers. And there were hundreds of them in the organization. It was open to civilians, but it was a New York City police detective who started it. And I learned an important lesson, uh, one I've always taken to heart since. Um, I was introduced to a local reporter from an Albany newspaper, that's our New York State Capitol, and he asked me a few questions about what I'd be speaking about and all, and I said something to the effect of, I'd like you to take a look around. You see people in this hall that have come here to learn more about a very controversial subject. Many of them are professional people. There's a smattering of PhDs. You've got a lot of police officers from around the United States. Uh, it's a real cross-section, to some degree, of thinking people who take this subject seriously. I guess my basic point is, you know, we're not just a bunch of guys that wrap our bodies in aluminum foil to keep out the gamma rays. And he thanked me very much for my statement and went off. Of course, I was very excited the next day to pick up the newspaper. There was a feature article on our conference and, uh, you know, read down the column to find my name and it was Peter Robbins, a speaker from New York City, said, quote, we're not just a bunch of guys who wrap our bodies in aluminum foil to keep out the gamma rays, end quote, and that was it. <laughs> Be careful what you say and how it's excerpted. And then we went on to wrap ourselves in tin foil and... <laughs> oh, under the clothes, sure. Yeah. You've got to keep out the gamma rays. I don't know. We, uh, I don't do this anymore with pleasure. And, uh, but we, uh, we had some fun stuff over the years, really weird and crazy. And I think the best thing to do if you ever go through a a thing like uh, I did uh, 27 years ago now is you keep your mouth shut. Um, because I, I, went, when I, I was well known in, in that circuit of madness for uh, years before our book got published in 97. And I, uh, so if you're a witness to something, you come out and you look for a, a researcher or someone that knows more than you, and none of them do actually. And then I found out how pretty much wacky a lot of uh, that field is and the people in it and uh, a lot of good ones, a lot of nutcases that have good names and um, you know, and how they uh, hijack witnesses and use them like, you know, and write bad books. And... So by 1986 I had seen myself in a lot of books misrepresented in this country and uh, some in mine. 
do certain things. So I said, I need, I'll do my own and I'll get another guy in, involved. And it was some, that guy from Vermont that kept wanting me to write reports for Dr. Alan Heineck. And, uh, and who I had met earlier, you know, from Close Encounters, the guy with the beard that does that and does that. That's what he did. That's all he did. Get him your brain. He did. That's why I have this now. And uh, it was his. And um, so they were really pompous kind of people back when I started. I was a young guy and in the rock and roll and pretty uh, screwed up after the military experience I had, amongst other things. And uh, I came out and uh, did a conference, and the first one I had was a, 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 a Masonic Hall, go figure, in uh, Connecticut. And it is a I was like, and this is what I saw where the, these researchers, when they got a hold of the case, because this thing was only rumored in 1982, 83, uh, that, you know, oh, we got this guy that went through it, there were no documents, there was no tapes, they all came out eventually because of the information they supplied. But the guy that was presenting this, wrote a book called Clear Intent, and then they had me come up like a, a little dancing monkey. And I said, what the hell is all this about, you know? And you say your thing, and there was a lot of paranoia in that field then. It was run by a lot of really old people with very old ideas, and you know, measuring, trying to explain a picture was not a Christmas tree over a house, which you kind of knew it wouldn't have been. <laughs> and that's when Bud Hopkins started to come out. I met him, he was kind of unknown, really, and widely. And I just kind of want to bring a party sense to ufology and kind of a Keith Moon sense to it and bring it down a bit. And we did that over the years. And, but by uh, 87, uh, we started working on this book. And uh, basically, we're going to come up with some outtakes. I mean, what you go through, because back then it had to be very serious, you know, and witnesses are only credible if someone deems you credible. And most of them are, uh, there's no, are there kids in here? Well, I won't say it, but there's a lot of cowards, you know, that, and now they use the internet, but back then they used to use newsletters, but you never met them, and, uh, and falsehoods and this kind of thing. And uh, you always want to get a hold of one of them, but in 27 years, I've never had one face up. Mm. So uh, we had some fun. I hooked up with this guy for an objective voice and thus became this new kind of phase and all this, and it was nine and a half years till we got published, a divorce in the middle of it, all kinds of other stuff that went on, and we met some characters, man, and I'll let Pete start with another one. We had experiences and saw the dark side of this whole thing, and whoa, go. <laughs> when I think back on uh, some of the more than memorable experience I had with Larry. One of my favorites happened in the earlier 90s. Uh, we had come back to the UK and we kept coming back. We both basically went bankrupt writing this book. So if anybody leads you to believe that you can become rich and famous writing a bestseller, think twice about it and keep your day job. I did not. Uh, we had done our work in Suffolk. We had a little time to spare. We had a a friend who was a British citizen but an American resident who had come over with us, lived close to Larry in Vermont. He said, you know, my sister, my, uh, her, her partner have a lovely cottage in South Wales, invited us to stay for a few days, and we went. And uh, they were great people, uh, had a lot of fun. And it worked out, Steve, this guy, was a good blues guitarist. And one of the things he was gonna do back in the UK was his first live gig at a pub in this area in many years. And I'm one of those guys who likes to cook. And I'm a pretty good cook. I mean, saved your life with chicken soup when we first met, as I recall, and cold. And it works, it's quite magic. It's just six hours to make a salad, though, man. Yeah, but it's a good salad. <laughs> you didn't complain when you ate it. All this, jeez. All right, I'll get on. A six-part series for TV on a cooking show. Right. That's right, and I watched a cooking show yesterday with the shorter Ronnie of the Ronnies. I was very happy to see that he likes to cook, too. Uh, but I volunteered to make dinner for the family before the show. And, you know, sort of took a consensus. Um, Steve and Linda's parents were coming in from Battersea in London. So it's going to be like seven people for dinner. And that morning, Larry and I and Steve and his uh, sister's partner, Jim, went into town. And we did the shopping for all the things I was going to need. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, chicken and a stir fry and fried rice. Terrific dinner, right? Yeah. And 
And we're coming back to the car. It's kind of a beat up old station wagon. And we've got our bags in hand. And as we get closer, we see there is a local police constable standing at the back of the car in this little village in South Wales, eyeing the car and the license plate suspiciously. And as we get close, <clears throat> he asks if uh, this is our car. And Jim says, yes, it's mine. He says, I see. How long have you been in town? About 45 minutes. And where are you from? This place. And you and you and you, we tell him. And he appraises, he apprises us that he would like us to come with him to answer some questions. And the way he put it was, you're not under arrest, but I'd appreciate your voluntarily joining me at our constabulary and answering some questions. Uh, we said, well, what's this about? He said, you'll find out when you get there. At this point, I stepped forward and, of course, uh, let him know that I had dinner to cook and that, you know, we had a time schedule. My friend would be playing uh, guitar that night. And what was the problem here? And um, he said, you'll find out at the police station. Again, you are not under arrest. And the way he said it, let us know in so many words that if we did not voluntarily accompany him, we would be under arrest. We were under caution. Yeah, and we waited for him to lead us on, and he made it clear that he was not going to be turning his back on us, and we should just proceed and give us directions. And so we walk several blocks to the local police station. We walk into the main room. Like any police station, desk sergeant, cops standing around chatting. We walk in, it's like the bad guy walks into the bar in the Western. Everybody goes quiet. And we're ushered into a back room. Main things I remember, bars on the windows, really depressing wallpaper, two little tables with lights and a chair on each side. He said two detectives will be in to question you shortly and then close the door and we hear the click. What is going on? A few minutes pass, two detectives walk in right out of an American police story as far as I'm concerned. The young, brash, good looking, full head of hair, hip dresser, the older, wiser, more conservative looking, thinning hair, done it all, seen it all, senior detective. They say, the reason you are here is because about an hour ago, our post office was robbed by a gang. And then he looks at me and he says, and with all, and uh, the leader of this gang, the man who seemed to be in charge, and he looks at me and he says, with all due respect, was slightly below average stature and had a foreign accent. They think we robbed the post office. And, over the next hour and a half, they kept questioning us, back and forth and back and forth. Left the room, came back, left the room, came back, watching my watch, got to make dinner. And finally they come in and say, well, uh, we appreciate your time. We don't think you're the people we're after, but you will not be leaving this town until we resolve this. Uh, and by the way, what are you two Yanks doing here? Well, we're working on a, 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 we're visiting friends after taking some time off from working on a book in Suffolk. What's your book about? At this point, hemmed and hawed a bit, and Larry finally said, look, you may be too young to remember, but you may. The UFO incident in Suffolk that broke in the papers in 83, they both remembered. He said, uh, I was involved as an airport security personnel witness, brought the matter to public. And they said, right, wait here. And they leave, and the door locks again. I think, oh, no. Well, they come back, and they say, pretty much, uh, you are free to go. Again, you'll stay in the area. We have a question to ask you before you leave, and this is completely off the record. What's the question? Are you guys busy Sunday afternoon? Yeah. Mm, no. Why? Again, completely off the record. This fascinates us. Would you go out drinking with us? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Well, um, we go back home. Uh, we report this story to Steve's sister. She laughs, says, oh, that's a copper bar that he wants to meet him at. We show up at the appointed time, they're there. The younger cop has his girlfriend with him. She is also a police detective. And over the next several hours, uh, they proceeded to pour us drink after drink. And mostly it was Larry talking and me sitting and listening and getting very hammered. And at the end, the older police officer looked at Larry and he said, you know, I've been a cop for over 20 years. A huge part of my job is to make character assessments. And 
make a, come to an informed opinion about whether or not anybody is telling the truth or lying. It's obvious that Larry is telling the truth. We wish you the best on the book and stay in touch. I did stay in touch with him. Um, the two detectives, uh, male and female, got married, had a little baby detective. And when we were doing our 15 city speaking to tour, uh, they showed up at one of our lectures. And it was great to see him. Other than great to see him, the, the cop came up to me, the guy that got married, and he said, you know what, after all that stuff with the UFO, he goes, we were parked, uh, staking out a drug deal one night, and he goes, and I'm telling you, Larry, a giant triangle thing flew right over our car. He goes, we believe, man, you watched it. So we had all kinds of neat things. They brought us a lot of uh, encounters with a lot of different kind of people, from high-level government people in this country to our country, a lot of celebrity kind of people, uh, they, well, some quite legendary, and uh, you find a lot of people are just people and they have interests in things. But we also had, uh, what people don't realize and when we get minimalized and things is that uh, we had a lot of uh, problems uh, once we started this book from our male, uh, I was used to male interference and things and a lot of people think that's from the paranoid fringe but this is real interference by male, real resealing of the envelopes with that it was opened, everything, phone problems, then it started to happen to him and he was supposed to be the objective voice, of course we had a a thing we write about in the book where uh, we had a, 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 quite an amazing UFO experience, which you minimalize as kids, which is good. Yeah. And, um, but some of the uh, crazy, crazy beings we went through in time were uh, amazing. I don't do this anymore, which uh, I'm, I'm thrilled because it took 25 years to pretty much be fed up. You can't play 19, year, 19 years old anymore. And uh, I'm not a researcher, and I find it boring, really whole thing because I know it's real. I, I see people writing write garbage on the internet. I can care less, you know, uh, bring it out. Uh, we did a damn good job. There's certain things you change in hindsight, but uh, we did bring that case to where it should be. That was us. Uh, other people were involved briefly over the years doing their little research and selling documents that was to the news of the world for 25k and you know, these are people with allegedly good names in this business, but I always smelled a rat with most of them. And so my, my thing was always to be uh, an advocate for witnesses that went through stuff. And, um, and yeah, I met some nice researchers in the day, but I find really a lot of them are just still in these bubbles because they haven't lived the stuff uh, I've been through. Now, Matt on the camera there, he was a big friend of ours during the, the, our tour and helped us out. It was like our roadie and mother hen and got us all over the place. And we had some good fun and uh, Judith and uh, was around in those days and there's some really good people in this field but we met the worst of them too and usually I'd s sniff them out before he would because Peter thinks everyone's got goodwill and uh, I don't and I uh, think they all do and, uh, and usually that came out to be true. We had some of the worst business people around us or never used publishers group West, they're filthy robbers. You can send this tape to them, sue me. Uh, you know, uh, be real careful because it, it's, it's just a shitty thing. We've had uh, our book option for a film in uh, 2001, and we were in Variety and all, and then 9-11 came and the option passed, Mr. Nick. And uh, it's all a funny means, but all we wanted was the money we earned. And I, I dropped, a, I, I'd hate to tell you the amount of, of cash on this thing over here. But it wasn't about money. You don't do this to make money. It was really, I wanted to inspire other witnesses that went through our thing to come forward. And a lot of them have done so and over the years. And it goes nowhere. It gets nowhere. It doesn't change the world. It doesn't mean beans. But I used to think it would. And, uh, but I think we have, I have my son. And that was better priority, I think. A lot better. But I'll tell you this story from New Orleans at the end. But I'll let you go on, because I'm just not up for all this stuff anymore. Yeah, I do tend to see the uh, best side of people to start with, but God help them if they cross me. Uh, and Larry's not exaggerating about mail and phone. Um, when I got into this, I didn't kid myself. If we even finish the book, how many people are going to read it? It's not going to change the world. I'm certainly not a threat to the United States government. But when we returned from our first trip uh, back to Suffolk, uh, within a month, my mail started arriving fairly regularly, uh, opened and resealed officially. Uh, Larry was having the same experience, 
And then we found out some of our best friends in Suffolk, who we stayed with and continue to stay with over the years, uh, run B&B, their mail was being opened and officially sent to them in plastic postal envelopes. So sorry, our mechanical rice picker chewed through your piece of mail. And I started to hear funny background sounds on my telephone in midtown Manhattan. My first thought, being a student of deductive reasoning, was not, oh my god, my phone was being tapped, was how come I don't hear this weird noise more often? I'm in the middle of New York City, how do they even run the phones here? But it persisted, and it started to unnerve me. And I had a friend who had a friend who worked for the phone company, and he moonlighted, you know, doing phone installations and the like. And I hired him to come in and, as they say, check the impedance uh, and run tests on my lines. And he finished by saying, you know, um, there is no question your phone is being irregularly monitored. Well, I freaked. I was very upset by this and actually somewhat accusatory and said, well, that's ridiculous. If they're monitoring the phone, I mean, I'm hearing all these things. Um, the whole purpose is to surreptitiously monitor your calls and they're giving the whole thing away. He said, no. There are two reasons that phones are monitored. One is just that, the classic reason, pick up information covertly. The other is to emotionally destabilize the person whose phone it is. And that is what happened to me. And uh, Larry, my, good, my best friend, saw me go through quite a change over those couple of years. I became much more insular and concerned. But again, uh, goofy things continued to cut the rather serious things. And a number of things happened to me over the years at airports coming and going uh, from Suffolk. On one trip back, uh, 1990, um, I had uh, collected soil samples from the site of the third night of the three nights of incidents that are the Rendlesham Forest incident. And uh, it was right from the site where Larry had his extraordinary, absolutely <coughs> seminal UFO event with many other Air Force personnel, I should add. Uh, the soil was right and properly transformed in the area that had been affected even almost 10 years later when I drew those soil samples. And the results of those samples were quite shocking in themselves. And I'm flying back uh, from Heathrow to JFK Airport in New York, and you get a little card to fill out, many of you are familiar as flyers, uh, when you're coming into another country. And I noticed for the first time on the American entry card that, you know, you check, of course, are you bringing any fresh fruits or vegetables or meats, which are no-nos. There's actually a check mark that says soil. I thought, bloody hell. If, if I check it, they're going to question me about it, and that's going to be ridiculous. I do not want to start answering questions about this soil. But if I don't check it, and they find it, I'm in trouble. If I don't check it, and they don't find it, and we get results, and I publish them, Somebody can always call me on it that you got that in illegally and there are complications and I gritted my teeth and said, hope for the best and I checked soil. Coming through re-entry back in Kennedy and uh, my customs guy says, you've checked soil here, why have you done that? I said, I have about mm, eight or 10 pounds of soil in my bag, why? Well, it's going to be tested at a laboratory in Massachusetts. Why? Well, um, I'm working on a book with someone, and this soil relates to the narrative of the book. What is your book about? Uh, it's about some things that happened to him when he was in the Air Force Station, and well, as you can imagine, he just kept asking me questions until I said, one of these containers contains soil that may have sat underneath a UFO that was in a field. Right, wait here. <laughs> disappears, comes back with another security, well, with the security personnel, and the two of them walk me to a room. Says, and they both say, wait here, close the room door on me, and come back with two more immigration uh, entry people. There are now four of these folks in their uniform standing around me. Please open your bag. These are laboratory court jars, and I have tape around the lid of each. And I pick one up, and I grab the lid. He goes, stop! Pardon me? Were you going to open that? Um, no. Are you, do you have any intention of opening it? Um, okay. I'm, I'm sorry here, I just uh, made an error. He, he, they, he said, um, right. Uh, and then they all got very human faces on, and the original guy said, so, tell us about the UFO incident. <laughs> 
And for the next 10 minutes or so, I gave him a running narrative. He asked what laboratory he was going to. I told him, pulled down a loose leaf, checked it. Yeah, it's a reputable laboratory. You're not going to open it? No, you're sure you won't open it? What are you going to do with it? Send it out FedEx tomorrow. And we did. And uh, that was that. One other airport story. I was coming back from London. Um, and I had actually visited with Nick Pope in London. And uh, he had given me several copies of a new book. Uh, one for myself, one for several other friends in the States. Got up that morning, shaved. It was actually January 1st. I was a tad hungover. And uh, threw my electric razor on the stack of books, threw a t-shirt on it, and headed to the airport. In the airport, I was waiting for them to ask me the question, did anyone give you anything to bring with you? As they used to ask, don't do it much now. So I could say, yes, and it's guy who works for the Ministry of Defense, aha. Uh -huh. And I said, yes, and she said, I see, wait here. <coughs> and the next thing I know, once again, I'm being transported to a security area where my bag is put through one of those baggage scanners, but this was as big as a Buick. It was the biggest one I had ever seen. And there's a product in America called Roach Motel. Uh, they sell them to kill roaches, and their motto is, uh, roaches go in, but they don't go out. My bag went in, but it didn't come out. And I looked at the furrows on the brow of the person reading the screen on the other side, and then the security person behind them. <clears throat> and then the other security person, and the next thing I know, three security people are walking me yet once again to a closed room at Heathrow. I spent a lot of time in these rooms. And they stood on the other side of the room when they said, please open your bag, which I did. They said, what is that? I said, that is a t-shirt. Lift it, please. What is that? That is an electric razor. Please remove it. Now, I know there's no problem, but I'm, I also know that they seem to know there is a problem. So I'm not being a wise guy or anything, following orders. He says, open that razor. I said, what do you mean? He said, take it apart. I said, well, if I do, all the little whisker hairs will, he said, take it apart. I did. Are there batteries in it? Yes, there are. Take them out. Put it down. What are those? Those? Those are books. Mm -hmm. Lift them out, please, one at a time. Right. They turn, they consult, and the lead guy looks at me and says, thank you for your assistance. You can reassemble your gear and leave. Now at this point, I got a little anxious. What had they thought? And at that point, I asked him, I said, if it's not inappropriate, can I ask you what you felt the problem was? And again, this lead guy got very human, looked at me and he said, sir, we are trained to search for profiles of materials, very specific profiles in luggage. And that electric razor sitting on that stack of books is exactly what plastic explosives with a detonator looks like. So folks, don't put your electric razors on your books when you come into the United States. And needless to say, the first thing I did when I got back home was I called Nick Pope and gave him hell for setting off a security alert at Heathrow. Yeah, transitioning from razors to you know, the funny thing is, in this field, if you're a witness, you kind of get dumbfounded about how uh, how many dumbasses out there kind of control the flow. And, you know, if you're a witness, probably a UFO community is not the place to run to, which that was about all there is to go to. But uh, in um, some years ago, and I think 25 years on the road has earned me this kind of uh, cynicism that I have about most things nowadays. Uh, but the, uh, the interesting, uh, I'm going to do a couple things and then you can pick it up because uh, one thing blew my mind, and maybe it would blow your mind, I don't know, I never understood it, but, and, um, you know, I was a whistleblower, really, and our book really isn't a UFO book, it's kind of a human book, it's about how an unknown phenomena affects people, and it's more about how governments can uh, meddle with people to keep unpopular truths from the public. I know what I went through. I don't know what it was, but I know what it wasn't. Uh, certain people write books and it's full of what it wasn't. And, uh, but in, uh, some years ago, uh, we were supposed to come for a television documentary over here before our book came out. And suddenly my passport got suspended uh, by the U.S. government, the State Department. Now, as far as I know, I was the first alleged whistleblower uh, 
to ever have uh, this happen. Yeah, and the, re the re really, and it was, this is what it said to me about the UFO research community. Because whatever criticisms you had of me, or it's actually, you know, whoever yells the loudest is gonna get all the shite anyway, but uh, didn't bother me. But this is one thing that was, there it was. There's another thing besides all the other evidence, here it is. And I was suspended for having uh, spoken about sensitive defense issues in a public forum on foreign soil, which was here. They wouldn't say what they were, and then they, I had to reestablish basically if I was even born, uh, the feds. And funny, through Peter, Ramsey Clark was a uh, United States Attorney General under uh, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, and he was Bobby Kennedy's assistant. Yeah, but he worked for Bobby Kennedy, which is even better, so I love that, because Kennedy touched me on the head in 68, said, what are you going to do when you grow up, young man? And I said, I'm going to be a gorilla. So my father said, if I went to college, I'd do whatever I wanted. And I believed it. But I didn't think I'd be uh, doing this for, you know, for over a quarter century, for whatever. That was the, that's proof I'm nuts. But uh, they did that to me, and I couldn't leave my country for a year as a U.S. citizen. My government. And I, I, it was to keep us from over here, because what I had done in a conference in uh, Leeds or wherever it was, was, yeah, Leeds, Nottingham. Uh, and I, you know, they're all northerners. I live up there too. All right. But uh, we get up there and um, I said, someone said, well, yeah, I said, we, I got sick of people saying this was of no defense significant, like the British government's like, hey, nothing happened at all this shit. And I said, well, we had nuclear weapons there. Now, I know Joe McGonagall, I think he's vaporized. Ooh, I can't imagine there were nukes. So I was, I was not a security policeman, I was a force protection guy, security, you know, security specialist. And our role was to defend the nuclear ordnance and aircraft. And I, we had tactical nuclear weapons on those bases. Now I never, well, I was kind of, I'm kind of a patriotic guy still. I love my country. And, uh, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I said, well, this was defense significance because these monkeys were shining beams of light down and adversely affected the ordinance. And my old boss, Charles Holt, told us that off the record. And uh, so I said it, and I said, well, if that, that's defense significance. And uh, that could have been a bad thing for England, you know, if one of them went pop, right? I, I would expect. And because uh, it was a one mile blast radius with them, I knew that, they told us. I mean, if the, we were a first strike option for the Russians then, so it's, and, um, so they did it to me, and what the amazing thing was, and you know, we're out for the truth, we're gonna get the truth, the UFO community, was that not one of them out there covered that and thought that was worthy of any attention. That made me very suspicious of the UFO community even more, and because everyone's got their own little agendas, and I imagine in this stuff, like flying monkeys might be someone's thing, and then, you know, some other kind of thing for other people. Everyone's got their own little thing. But I mean, at the end of the day, the truth. And I did the, you know, the disclosure project in 2001, and I was honored. I thought Greer and his people were a cult and a control freaks, but I was with some real heavyweight Air Force guys that ran air bases. And they said, our book inspired them to want to go forward and do it. And yet you have this other guy there that was involved in every crash recovery, uh, had a meltdown and fainted at the National Press Club and politicians are all oh, you great guy crying about an alien he found somewhere that was injured and as he's fainted and this is what I knew I had to get the frig out of this stuff is that he's on the floor oh it was terrible and they're like oh Mr. Stone I'll help you I was let it go and um, and all of a sudden he's like this I think I'll be alright and by the way my tapes are available for two dollars out the hallway and so, you know, I brought the whole thing down, but I, I met politicians, and they said, we want to know what's going on, and the UFO community at large weren't allowed into this thing. I thought that was good. And, uh, except our good friend Tim Beckley with his flashing lights and straw hair, he was cool. But at the end of the day, I just saw all this duplicity and BS in this field, and uh, I just saw the witnesses as the ones that suffer. And I think the witnesses are the best ones to drive this shit. Charlie. So do that. I'm a researcher for Calvin Hickson and Charlie Parker's UFO, where they fell asleep on a beach and, or on a lake or a river somewhere, and a UFO abducted them, and then they told us some other version of it, which I won't get into, but it actually did happen.
But we went down, we did this PBS thing. The guy thought I was hitting on his wife in this Holiday Inn. So if you look at the, the pilot show, Stan Friedman was on it and a few other people. Bill's like, he was talking to him nice, but with me he was like, baby, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> and he grew up in Tupelo. It was like an Elvis kind of character. So we got over that. I thought the guy was gonna kill me or they're gonna throw us in the swamps. So on this night, I get down there and uh, I'm gonna transition, but we get down to, uh, you didn't go. We did a pilot again in Orlando and then drove across and he goes, you boys wanna come out to my house in Slidell, Louisiana. And I go, why not? So off we went in the big Cadillac. And Penny, that girl, was there again. And we're thinking, these guys are rich. So we get out there and, uh, to their house, and it was like this ranch house. But I noticed after about three days, this guy just slept in a suit. I mean, that was, it was like in a coffin. And his wife just wore one of his white shirts, and that was it, man. And it was like, she, she kept picking up stuff all the time. So Pete, I thought this is really weird and interesting, but there's crocodiles all over the place and southern people, and it was really unnerving. And uh, then one night, so we go out, and this guy did not believe in UFOs at all. So I'm, we're, coming, we're at a Shoney's restaurant where you can actually eat alligator pieces and things, which is, does taste like chicken. And uh, we're at a glass thing, and there's a blue flash, a light. And everyone in the restaurant looked at each other. Hmm, did you see that? Yeah. He goes, oh baby, what was that? So we headed down the road, and there was an old gas station. I said, hey Bill, do you ever get UFO sightings around here? And he goes, well, you know, some, you know, it takes them a while down there. And he goes, well, sometimes we get this. And all of a sudden, there's this giant golden thing over this gas station. I'm like, whoa. So we park the car. We get out, we watch it, and start to move away. There's all swamps around. So the next thing I know, we're going and telling Penny, who has the white shirt on still. And he goes, I'm going down to get cigarettes down the old store. And uh, she goes, OK. And off he went. And so we're standing there, and all the lights in the house went out and then came back on, and we're like, oh, what's that? So I said, that thing's back, we just felt it. And then Bill came back and goes, that thing's down the road again. So I'm like, whoa, okay. So Pete and I, who doesn't believe in UFOs, get out and we go walking around the neighborhood. It's all flatland down in New Orleans and Louisiana, know, or Mississippi. I guess it was over the Lake Pontchartrain, train, wherever we were. Uh, and we're walking around and I'm saying, I know that thing's around here, I just feel this feeling, it's really creepy. And I, we had cameras with us, and I turned around and faced their house, and Penny <laughs> is standing on the front yard, the guard in the front yard with a lamp, kind of looking at whatever in her white shirt. And I looked, and above the house was this gigantic flying triangle. It was just sitting there, the superstructure on it was amazing. And Pete, who doesn't believe in UFOs now, was starting to freak out, so we started taking pictures. And we ran up to it. I ran under, I mean, it was literally about 100 feet off the ground. was standing under the, this wing, that wing up down here. And uh, you could throw rocks in. Just sitting there quietly. And Penny, I said, look, look. And Penny fainted on the front yard. And Bill's like, oh, baby, what's this? And then trying to drag Penny in, and her shirt came off. And it was really, I mean, this all happened. It was like a hillbilly thing going on. So I ran after this object, and it started moving, and I'm under the wing, and there was a little, uh, there's a picture of this thing, and I, they did survive, and they're the amazing pictures. And the last documentary Graham Birdsall did, it was the Staffordshire UFO group or something produced it, and I, I happened to present those pictures on it. But there is, there's a little fella in this bubble, whether you believe in aliens or not, but there was one of these SOBs looking at me with a hat on through a, this big bubble. And we're both looking at it, and I took a picture of it. And I got it. So uh, we come back, and uh, it was pretty mind-blowing. They were shocked. I don't think they wanted me in the house anymore, because they kind of thought there was some link with that. But on the second picture I took it, but the camera shut down and then rewound. It was brand new Roma film. And, but I did catch it. I don't push it, put it out there a lot, but my god, it is bizarre. And the lighting effects have been looked at by people that know this stuff. This can't be reproduced. Amazing stuff. But uh, it's almost like alien art, man. It's just a trip. That little sucker looking at me, he's probably a hillbilly too, but he's looking at me. He had a little hat, man. I'd go figure that. But so the next day, they were kind of uncomfortable. And Pete was melted down too, because he, now he has seen a UFO and didn't like it and flew. He left. He left. So, but before he left, we are watching a movie with Kevin Costner that night. This is when I knew I'd never live in the Deep South. And Bill's over in the corner. Penny was asleep, passed out. And, uh, Bill's on this big chaise lounger, and he goes, you boys all right? And he lit up a big cigar. 
And he still had his white shirt on. And I kept seeing this black thing moving on his shirt. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And the thing went up his arm and got onto the cigar, went down on the end, and Bill lit it. And it exploded. It was a water bug. And it was, he didn't even know it was there. Just And I, we, I left the next day. I think I went chasing hookers and drinking heavy in New Orleans, but then I left. And, um, but then the darndest thing about it all is that that was a crazy, southern, weird, kind of Tennessee Williams UFO experience. But the, uh, the great thing is, is that, the bad thing is that flood, the big hurricane that happened, wiped out that whole town. So we don't know where Bill and Penny are now. They might be drifting, Bill holding on to Penny somewhere, maybe. But um, that, that was real cool and strange and depressing. But at the uh, end of the day, uh, I forgot the other thing I was doing. That's about the only thing that sticks with me anymore is that experience. It was mind blowing. So UFOs are real and all that kind of thing. And we've had a lot of adventures. I might do a book called Dirt from Mars sometimes with a lot of the numbskull stuff that went on. But um, you know, I don't have much to say about it anymore. I'm comfortable with it myself because it ain't healthy beating your head against the wall for quarter of a century, so, but it's an honor to talk to you. I'll let you finish this thing. Maybe. Uh, the photo Larry is talking about is amazing, and it has been analyzed, and <clears throat> it's one of the most extraordinary UFO-related photos I've ever seen in my life. Also, again, this guy, Ramsey Clark, who helped us get Larry's passport back, uh, I cannot underscore the importance of his position. Uh, he was the Attorney General of the United States, under President Johnson, he was the assistant deputy, he was the deputy attorney general under President Kennedy. And in my student days, he blew a lot of our minds by leaving his post. Again, this is the highest ranking uh, barrister, uh, attorney, uh, lawyer in the country. And within a week, coming out absolutely against the war in Vietnam, being the first cabinet level official to do so. A lot of Americans, uh, think of him as heroic, other ones think of him as a traitor because he's a man of principle and he does what he feels he has to no matter how it looks. Uh, you last heard about him in the news some years ago because he was part of Saddam Hussein's defense team. He felt that everybody in the world deserves a fair trial. Uh, but we spent time together. He met with me twice in New York, pro bono I should add, and this is a gentleman who can charge an awful lot for his legal services. Then Larry came down from Vermont, and the three of us met together in his office. And after some talk about the case, uh, and he was very comfortable with the fact that it had been UFO related, uh, rather than the nuclear uh, aspect, uh, Larry asked him, well, you know, ultimately, how do I get my passport back? I don't know how it is here. In big cities in America, you go to passport bureaus, uh, branches of our State Department, to file for a passport. But for most folks, like myself in rural America now, like Larry at the time in a small town, a small city in Vermont, uh, you go to your local post office and you do the work there. Anyway, Larry had filed for a passport, had been informed that, thank you for your interest in a passport, this is what you need to do. Send us a check, fill out this form, send us a photo, which he did. I was just renewing my passport, because yeah. I've held a passport since It had, you know, come due. And he sends him the check, the photo, the form. He gets a form letter back from the State Department saying thank you for your interest in a United States passport. And it's getting a little like the Twilight Zone. He contacts the State Department. Uh, they're having problems with his records. And shortly after, his records de disappear off the computers at the State Department. This is when I got very anxious, and certainly he was absolutely furious. And ultimately, uh, we asked um, Clark how to go about getting the passport back. He said, that will be fairly simple. What you do, Larry, when you get back to Vermont, you go back to your post office. You go to see the clerk you've been dealing with. You tell him you've just gotten back from New York City and meeting with your attorney. And my attorney told me to tell you that if I do not have my passport within, I think it was two weeks, plus a refund for the money that I had already sent them, plus an apology, tell them that former Attorney General Ramsey Clark will make them wish they were never born. <laughs> had the passport back within two weeks with an apology. He, did, he called them, actually, for the State Department for me. Well, and it worked. It, it worked. But, um, 
You know what? Let, let's do. Does anyone? I know this kind of a flying reptile thing and Bigfoot, and you know, I believe in that, but because I saw it. But you know what? Is there any questions that people might have of us instead of? You know, is there any questions that people have about Bent Waters or Rendlesham or whatever people want to call it or anything? Any? Does anyone know about this thing here? Or, boy, oh boy, it's wild. <laughs> you would be. <laughs> it was what was inside the shirt that would have kept her alone. <laughs> All right, Robert. Isn't that guy a gem? I'll tell you. Man. Now, Larry, when oh sorry, when the, Just UFO, when the UFO was above and uh, she fainted, which were you looking at, the UFO or her shirt coming off? I was torn between the three. <laughs> <laughs> I have my priorities, brother. Hold the invasion. But I'll tell you, I thought, man, the clan were going to show up eventually. And, uh, you know, well, one thing we did, I will say that happened, as we were pursuing this object for a while in, in a car, we were pulled over by police. And I jumped out with my camera. I forgot that part. And there were guns on me. And they said, get the F back in the car and all this. And the guy came up and asked Billy, goes, what are you guys doing? We're hearing on the radio other police officers reporting this object. And he goes, uh, I have to be careful with this one, but he said, uh, hey, what are you guys doing while we're just driving around and uh, didn't want to get into it? And he goes, oh, we thought you boys were buying drugs from the N-word. And I was like, what? And Bill, Bill grabbed me. I was going to say to the cop, what the? And he said, son, you're from the north. They'll put you in the swamp because the old South is the same. He said, they will hang you from a tree. <sighs> Like Barney, what was that, Barney Fife Land or something? I don't know how they do it down there. Any other questions? I don't have a question for you, but something of an explanation. The reason the US immigration freaked out when you had soil samples was because of potential pests. Oh, I know that. In the United States, we know. you only have the one species of uh, nematode pest of potatoes. In the UK, we've got two, and one of them doesn't have uh, a resistant form of potato. So if that got in, you have to go back to using the pesticides, which most of them are banned. They're not banned here, but they should be. What they would have freaked out about, though, was one Springborn Labs, which, uh, another thing that gets ignored, uh, analyzed our soil. It was pretty darn amazing what went on. And what ended up in our book was not the whole complete analysis. So they would have freaked out more for that. Yeah, the soil that I collected was from the site where Larry had pointed literally reflexively when we had been there a year and a half before and there was an elliptical discoloration in the soil. Uh, I went back a year and a half later. Uh, it was summer now and the field was entirely gone to hay. There's some very good photos of this, except for the ellipse, which was bright green. Collected the soil. The analysis revealed the following, among other things, that there was four plus the amount of very small metallic particles in the affected <coughs> sample than in the surrounding samples, and of course I took control samples from around the field. Our analysts felt that was the result of an extraordinarily powerful magnetic or electromagnetic force that literally pulled these tiny sand-sized grains of metallic bits through packed soil, which is an awful lot of stress. The second thing was they did seed germination tests. Everything was absolutely normal in the control samples, but in the affected sample, everything took longer to grow, and everything that did grow was mutant. Hence the fact that when everything was already uh, gone to hay in the field, that ellipse was slowly, uh, but still bright green. For me, the most dramatic findings were, um, if you look at this location on the map, we can't be more than uh, half a dozen miles from the water. And you'd expect, being that close to the sea, to have a silica or a sand content in the soil. And of course, the control samples checked out absolutely normal for the amount of sand content that they would expect to find. In the affected sample, the bits of sand were, in the dispassionate words of our soil analyst, in an interim form of glass. They had melted. Glass, of course, is primarily melted sand. 
and he said, try as they could in this nationally respected laboratory with certainly tens of millions of dollars worth of equipment, they were unable to replicate what happened to the sand in that field. <clears throat> and somebody had asked me yesterday, do you feel this was a PSYOPs operation or a, a mind control or something? Well, if it was, it melted the sand and other things that were very physical and don't normally reflect hypnosis. Just last thing, you know, if, uh, you remember the movie JFK, and that kind of inspired me sometimes when we were writing, because conspiracies do happen. And we've met people around that thing, that Kennedy thing. We relaxed by researching Kennedy for a few years just to get off the Bentwaters thing. And that blew your mind. That was just a crime. But at the end of the day, uh, Reynolds and Forrest uh, was, I, was not a lighthouse. It wasn't a government experiment of satellites and all this. And it, it's ad nauseum. You can't keep saying it for a quarter of a century. I refuse to even entertain it for any more. But, uh, and like Costner says in the courtroom at the end of the day, this happened in your country. Uh, you may have different interests, but you have a right to know about it. There's meat to it. It's real. None of the witnesses are lying. None of us have made money out of it, even if we wrote a book. And we're, believe me, we're proof of that. But like Costner says, it's up to you. And that was the heavy part of that film. Looks right at the camera. It's up to you. You either give a damn or you don't. But nowadays, I am worried about it. But I wish you all the best. Larry and Peter, thank you very, very much. <coughs> It's the first time I finally managed to get him to talk about what happened, not show the video.